brief introduction. Uh, I'm Vincent Batts. I'm very happy to be here. It's it's not only a, a curiosity of like having grown up in the open source community and been uh, one of those fringe periphery like mild contributions, mild patches, documentation updates, and stuff like that for years, but um, to actually effectively find myself in the mix of the open source community is quite a delightful thing. Um, much less to be here with other hackers. It's nice. <laughs> um, so I, I come representing Slackware in some capacities. Um, although, like many people who dabble with Linux or do some kind of distro hopping or binge distro hopping or whatever they do, you know, everybody can say they've, they've likely used Slackware at some point in their history. It might have been their first, it might have been a project, who knows what. And um, I, I, I would put myself in that same category forever because uh, as a Linux user, I was born and raised on SUSE, open SUSE. Um, that was my mainstay for years. So uh, I think we got a census of these yesterday, but all right, do we have anybody that more or less uses or Arch is a pretty close cousin in a lot of ways and philosophies, but any other Slackware users in the room? Not really. Didn't think so. No, but I live near Patrick. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Way up in the sticks or what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you like those cold winters too, don't you? Yeah. Gosh. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's interesting, and we heard a little bit of this yesterday, about how many people come at Linux from either a homebrewed side or an academic side. Uh, you know, like you're a student and you're learning C++, or you're a hacker and you're learning C++, or you just want to, you know, screw the establishment and go try something different, and you come at it from a homebrew perspective. Uh, and that, that's the route that I've come into this community from, because uh, like Alvaro, my, my university and the initial parts of my work experience, my university degree is in account international business. <laughs> so I have no place being here. <laughs> Um, but finding myself dabbling in projects and doing the things that I like doing uh, led me to some interesting places. Uh, so an overview, th this is basically what I'm going to cover in the talk. A lot of this will be no big news to some people. It might demystify some processes and in a broader sense of things because of where my work experience has left me, um, I do still work on systems that deploy to SUSE systems. I still, uh, my day to day is a Debian shop. We are a very hacked up Debian Ubuntu shop. Um, and it does not matter. It really is, uh, I, uh, I could like hug and squeeze any packagers and maintainers for that because Linux, unlike many systems that say, no, you will do it this way. <laughs> It doesn't matter. When you, when you start demystifying and figuring out the glue that holds everything together, it, it's, it's all cut from the same cloth, you know, whatever you want to say about it. So dependencies, how the vanilla involvement has really been a nice, pleasant thing, how to manage your builds, um, be it ultimately you're playing with RPMs, you're ultimately playing with dev, dev packages, or you're actually just have a build box that you play with that could be slack for um, additional packages and then recovering your system from a mess. So <laughs> this is about what I felt like when um, when all this was first starting because I was literally wanting to play with KDE. I mean, like I've been a long time user of KDE. I love 3.5. I was at first one of those like, eh, I don't know. Eh, eh. You know, I like, I like my K control. I like stuff like that. Um, so the whole 4.0 release and all this, you know, new integrations and new deployment. I was averse to, but I wanted to be in on enough to say, see what I might be missing. <laughs> um, and the systems that I had access to, I was breaking the holy bejesus out of um, because I was trying to do code deployments of, I was trying to get all my environments and you know so I could stay work, you know, home and comfortable, but have a working and running system. And Everything was moving very fast. Lots of new dependencies or switches and changes and how everything was going. Um, and so the transition from here was like truly like, oh my God, widgets, you know, people were so excited and it was crashing all the time. And, you know, this was fantastic. And to get to here from there uh, is truly what brought me 
into the Slack workflow uh, because I was, I was, like I said, breaking the systems that I was on. And this is partly because, like any up and coming Linux user, you have the full rights to break your system how you want to and um, complain about it as much as you want to or as little as you want to. And in my pursuit of figuring this out is what I was I was searching around for something that would you know I could get out of could get out of my own way and play with something or package something and figure it out and getting to talk to different people uh, there's like Carol was saying earlier there are people out there that are eager to listen sometimes and finding finding your crowd that will do that the audience ended up being Slackware, and that was very nice and neat. So, all the different dependencies, all the different uh, processes there, and actually being able to cleanly handle upgrades and downgrades, and not having clashes, and uh, sometimes, you know, for better or worse, whether you realize that you're, you know, wanting to make libraries clash, and the, the beautiful thing about having dependency resolution of, you know, an RPM-based system is that from a system administrative you know, rolling out perspective, you can make things so that users won't be shooting themselves in the foot, you know, this fundamental library and architectural differences or something like that. But sometimes as a developer, you might want to just say, listen, I, I know that I'm running a 64-bit system, you know, shoving a 32-bit package in here, or these libraries have conflicting or conflicting libraries or two packages on the same file, I, I know that, you know, do it. <laughs> and when you start getting into dash dash forces and stuff, it makes people a little fringy, but sometimes that's, that's what you want to do. So the, the interesting and fun part that, that I found was that in a base installation, most, almost all of your immediate dependencies are already present, so you're not out hunting for not just the binary of something, but the headers for it, the documentation for it. It's there. So, because I use it on a daily basis, I love the aspect of a trim down. I just want the binaries to deploy. Don't give me headers, don't give me main pages. Just drop a binary out there. But from a developer standpoint, if I install you know, the KDEV platform, KDE binding, something like that. I want the collection. I want the monolithic package. And that's what you get. Um, it's not a very mystical thing. It's as much as you would expect to get if you did, uh, if you were compiling the source yourself. So when you're going through and doing a, a, an install to get what I'm describing here, it's like all your immediate dependencies are there. In the, in the Slacker installer, this is what most people are going to be expecting if you go off asking, you know, for KDE help or, you know, some kind of development question somewhere, is that it, it comes with a base, you know, selection of packages. You can choose not the, the facts and how-tos, you can choose not Emacs or whatever, but fundamentally, your base Linux, KDE, your libraries, everything, it is a, a managed set. This is not a all-encompassing, like at some point, one package will get added because somebody felt like it and everything gets regenerated and like a big amorphous cloud of packages. It is a core set. And so when you get that full install of packages, everything is coherent and you know, plays nicely. Um, and so then secondly, I, I, this is just a, a, a disclaimer, you know, for most people, everybody's, you know, open and willing to whip out the command line or, you know, you're you know, you quake or whatever, and have, have access to a command line uh, coming from, I guess, the top down. So I enforce everything from the bottom up. You, you get a clean installer. You have a command line. It's you know, init two for some people, init three for others. That that's what you get. So don't fear it. There's nothing mystical about it. <laughs> it's the, it's the innards behind what you're already doing. So the monolithic. And, and feel free to interrupt me at any point in this, because I'm almost <laughs> So, as far as the mystical aspect of a 
monolithic package that you know the headers match the binaries, you know, and trusting that somebody <coughs> who set up the specs for that built package, you know, the dependency resolves it. I want the headers for this binary to make them work. I don't want to have rates and resolution there. It's as much as you'd expect if you had gone and checked out some library, built it yourself, and then make make install some dester, and you have a dester aspect of man pages and shared files and whatever else binaries. All those things are coherent in and of themselves. That is effectively what you get. It. So the packages are not. Uh, anything more than a shell script that packages them. So there's no like domain specific, how, how am I going to make this macro work? How am I going to do any of this? And there's really no auto magic to it. So for you to be trying out something new for the first time that there's no package for, you could you know, CMake, make, in, CMake, make, make install to some dester, tar that up, voila, you, you have a package. It's not magic. <laughs> so by the same token, you, you can quickly and easily have something that then that you can deploy. You don't have to go through and describe a macro, describe all these different things. Um, so you, you can easily have revisions or you know something that you can then tuck that away and play with at a later point. But there's there's kind of a set template of making those build scripts. But by the same token, you could just as easily have some, you know, bash foo function that will do that for you. So managing those builds, again, like a bash foo function, make package, there's the core set of package management utilities uh, for, you know, installing, upgrading, removing, and so forth. Make package with a few, you know, intricacies you can CD into the directory that would be the root of your installation. So you, you know, look around and there's user, share, whatever, user lib, whatever. You're in that directory. You can make package to somewhere else and it will do <coughs> everything it needs to make to make sure that that will cleanly deploy. So the interesting part about that that keened me in is because then I don't have to go through worrying about making various spec files. I can literally just be trying something out for the first time or like in the, the beta process, here's a brand new dependency that I didn't know I was going to need. And you're, you find yourself off in a rabbit chase of like, I'm, I'm trying to get to here, but now I've got to come over and try some new package that there might not be. You know, it's a fledgling project. You go check it out, make install to some duster, make a new package, install that package. Great, I'm right back to where I was. I'm not worried about dependency resolution. I'm not worried about anything else in that thread. I can stay on the project of what I'm currently on. So I was making packages that even though they were not your standard like user local or opt or whatever else, it was even in my you know, the KDE test user, so home KDE, KDE4, all that stuff, and managing local user installations so I could have a nightly subversion build but still have revision, you know, my packages for it uh, very easily. So that, and then once you start tagging stuff so that you don't have collisions with your package as to somebody else's upstream or uh, from any updates you get from the, the Slacker core updates. So just like I was saying, this is the magic. You know, like behold, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> So you could literally have something that you want to iterate over, not worry about leaving corrupt files behind. Um, I, I, has anybody played with Make Package or any other build and packaging tools at all? Good. So I mean, it's it's it's, it's not too foreign of a of a process. I mean. RPM build to some spec file or some set of flags or some source RPM. Uh, some shell script, voila, you have a, a, a tree of packages, make package. It's it's shell basic. And, uh, 
that, that, that simplicity allows you for your own utilities or your own processes. Um, and then in the aftermath, it's, it's actually been pretty nice for having other systems like a night to build Hudson or now Jenkins or something like that. The build steps are very easy. I don't have to go into lots of description and verbosity on saying, here's some Git repository. I want you to download it, CD, you know, make it, CD to that directory, <coughs> make me a package. I have artifacts now. <coughs> Similarly, there's explode package. So you could have made something that you then later want to revisit. Say you want to add like a, a, a post installation script or something like that, or uh, some kind of <coughs> care not to clobber existing configuration files or something like that. You could have tarred it up realize that you installed it and it clobbered something, you can go back and explode that same package almost as uh, similarly as tar XF, that thing, but revisit it and then repackage it up with <coughs> without any difference being made there. So I've kind of already covered the fact that the, the Slack builds as they were, if you ever see anybody's source code or like slackbuilds.org, it's not much more than where to get the source from and a shell script of what to do with that. Uh, very similar in a lot of ways to like ports from, from BSD. So you, or ports, you, can, you can just say like, here's this thing, go make it. Um, there's still no dependency resolution, but you'll have a readme saying you need these other packages to install, you know, like runtime or build time dependencies. So, the shell script just has packaging intentions, and it's actually been pretty nice because all up until the last line of using make package, you could substitute in other systems like if the make package isn't there, then just cd into the directory and tar, you know, tar cf that directory, <coughs> uh, which has been neat for actually work, being able to have similar thoughts in a very simple, legible process and taking it up over to other systems when you have a heterogeneous environment. Uh, the only other two, and there's really a third one, but nobody uses it, two other structural tips that would be in your root, like user and bin and everything else, is a description of the file, so it shows up in the installed packages or whatever, a description, your brief little summary um, of what that package is, and then a do, do inst, which is as much auto magic as you're going to get. And it is a post install script. So for anybody like with other macro tags, it, it is after all the other files have landed, but um, before the installer exits for that one package, it's not after all the packages have been done. So most applications um, that need to update some application database resource, user share apps or whatever, some kind of desktop database app. Update. Simple breakdown, and this is not even a requirement right here, except that some new packages like uh, Slack PKG, which is now included in the base, Slack PKG will fetch from a repository. So you can just say, here, update to the latest and install any new packages or upgrade anything else. Uh, it expects this same breakdown. But otherwise, if you really want to venture off rogue, this is not even a requirement because you could just specify this is the package I want, the full file name, this is the package I want to install or remove. But the tag on the end is where you could include your own initials and it will separate that as a different fundamental package. So upgrades or variations there. The two various projects right now that are, have gained a lot of traction is slackbuilds.org and a package manager, a utility to manage that now is SBO package. Uh, so slackbuilds.org, SBO, and then there's an SBO PKG. So you can, if it's not in the core set of packages, you can search for it, find it, see what its dependencies are, set you up a queue, build that, that queue, um, and have that in as well, but 
this is again if you're varying off, you know, venturing off to do some project or you know, you have some other interest of desktop applications or whatever. Slack builds is completely a user community contributed project. So you know, 27 different 2700 plus packages available and probably equally as much however many thousands of maintainers. Some people might have one package, some people might have 100, 200 packages that they maintain. But that's all computer uh, community fed in. So recovering from a mess, again, this is where I, I've made a few iterations in just trying to get to my goal of seeing what KDE 4 was about and finding that I was getting very good at breaking and rendering useless a lot of systems. Um, the fact that there is a core set of packages that I could elect to take or not elect to take, and with utilities like Slack PKG, it was effectively like you have a template of what a core install is, just like many CDs now that you get like a live disk or something, you say, here, install me this new system, and it's got you know that core set of packages, like a, a meta package, like Ubuntu desktop, you say, install me Ubuntu desktop or Ubuntu desktop and it resolves everything it needs and says here's your structure of packages that's what you get that same dependency resolution of some meta package like Ubuntu desktop that is what you get in a core installation no dependency resolution but you get that core set of packages so the utility slack PKG adheres to that concept so you can say install anything new that's from you know the core set upgrade anything that's existing, or clean my system. You can, you know, it'll give you an election, so you can, it'll go through and say, here's everything that you have installed that's not a core set package. So at any point you feel like you've ventured too far off or you, you know, want to find anything that's, uh, you might have installed at some point later and is not a core package, you can go through and prune that stuff back and get back to your core tree of just the base bare essentials of a, of a system. Um, right now that's 930 packages, but uh, it would take some for languages and other translations. So the benefits of not having any dependency chains, again, you could have clobbering packages, you can have, it gives you the freedom to really mess up your system, or the freedom to just try something, pull it back out, uh, see if it fixes this is you like you're working on some you know console package or get that thing in or, or maybe not console but some like pull, pull policy kit you're trying it out it fixes this behavior over here but now you've got a SO change you know SO name change and it breaks something up somewhere else that's fine I'll get to that later you know it fixes my issue over here it's a, most most of the time this is something that somebody will install put in some special place, run its one time, and then you know delete that temporary directory. It's effectively the same concept, but you can manage it in a package and say, here, I'll, I can revisit this tarball of binaries and installables at a later time. Um, like, like anything else, you, you, if you're wanting to recover your system, the nice part about it is that you can do so without having to just whip out a disk, back up your personal data, and clobber your install. You can do so on a running system and be up and ready pretty quickly. So I would always recommend either having a local like rsync mirror of the core set packages or just a, a, an ISO or something like that, a DVD. So were you in a situation that you've clobbered something or you make install this brute and blue stuff all over your system? you need to roll back to existing packages. You can just go to those core packages or wherever you're wanting to pull from and just say, run through all these, these you know, tarball packages, reinstall them. Uh, that will clobber the same files that were already there. So like in the instance you did a make install as root and stuck stuff where it didn't need to go. That'll, that'll help you out. Uh, Slack to get you clean system get you back to a core set. And then there's a few other utilities out there that are not in the course, core Slacker utilities yet, but are handy for quickly seeing lists of packages, files that those packages own, uh, timestamps of when packages were installed, 
uh, or tracking down ownership of file, like here's this file somewhere on the file system, what package owns that? Um, so there's utilities out there like Slack Utils that will do that as well. Because the most people don't realize or don't think about the fact that there is package management much further that you can infer the same information like ownership times and description and order to where stuff goes and install history and the upgrade history of packages. So all that being said, it, it allows for having a very speedy recovery so that you can really mess up your system and get back to a working system without having to worry about doing a big upgrade or a full reinstall from scratch or uh, whether, whether or not you do a home partition, you know, separate home partition, you don't have to go that far. You can actually do it mid flop because you're dealing with like a bare, bare steel system, uh, bare bones. Any particular questions? So I know I kind of flew through that, but uh, it's the talk. Uh, I didn't realize that it was as much a core developer, some you know, gathering folks here. I, I honestly, like from what I've read, I think you thought it was going to be more of a student gathering or you know, welcome to KDE. You need something to hack on. Um, but in any event, it's say, something that I'd say. Don't worry about that because there's people from all. Yes. of all levels yeah. here, and, and most of us don't have experience with software, so getting the tutorial is interesting. Or packaging in general. Yeah, or packaging. <laughs> yeah, and, and, that's, and, and there's there's a true divide in that, and it's even funny <laughs> having come from, from that, you know, working with seeing binaries and the whole idea of there being packages that people can install, and most of the time people really don't care, they just like want the one, you know, I want this application, so like the, the the OpenSUSE now, how it has like, you can make sure to click on something on a web page and it will launch and say, if you don't have this repo, add this repo, update, here's the file you want. That's, you know, the simplicity that most people want. They just, I, I don't care about A to Z, just keep it to Z. So when you you actually get out in the corporate world, it's pretty hysterical that you have a true <coughs> divide in the same faction, that you have developers that know I can just code this thing and it will do that. But how do you actually deploy that code? <laughs> and you're running the same challenges out there, and it's it's kind of fun because when you have a, uh, a system like all of them, they're all, all super. But you can generate tarballs, dev packages, whatever, and know the fundamentals of it. It, it makes it very demystified. So, can you comment at all on KDE as an upstream? Um, we like I like KDE. Uh, we <laughs> like KDE. Um, I mean, are, do, you, do you think that we're uh, like relatively easy to work with and, and to package from, or like how do we stack up against other other projects? In the world? Um. So you, I can speak as much you know as as myself on on that, and then <coughs> give you a couple of different perspectives. So number one, it's it's nice only having like 23 packages in the core bundles. You know, KDE you know, education. And, Libs and workspace and all that stuff. It's nice having just that tarball set. So, um, and especially now, like there's 4.6 and 4.62 is coming out, you know, tomorrow maybe. Um, that we're still getting just core bundles of stuff, even though the Git transition has exploded that out, you know, made it really good for collaboration among everybody else. I would hope to God that um, the bundles would not be as plentiful as the projects are. You know that it would stay it is 23 packages, not you know broken down to like console has its own tarball and everything else. But uh, it sounds like that's a, been a consensus, and so we're not as worried about that. We do love KDE for the fact that it has stayed true even from 3.5 to 4. That you do have just the same monolithic type of implementation of here's KDE education. Now, if I want to just compile one aspect of that, you know, I just want to go in and get like K stars or whatever, great. You, you know, you can do that. But here's this package that is the educational suite. Um, and the dependencies, even though it was greatly increased in going to KDE 4, have remained pretty manageable and with, with fair reason. Um, and for the most part, it's been really an open open communication 
back and forth if we have something to talk about. Uh, we do keep very vanilla as far as the upstream, so for most purposes, we're just packaging it. Um, not worry about getting out and doing some forefront development of, you know, this is how we're going to make free desktop and open desktop.org stuff work for Slackware and how we play with, with KDE and others. So sometimes there's, you know, <coughs> just like anything, there's needs to be, and it's been pretty good communication back and forth on that. Um, but Slackware is the premier desktop for anybody that wants a desktop experience on Slackware because GNOME was cut out uh, from the core set four or five releases ago. And there's other people that maintain that, but that's effectively a third party addition now. <coughs> like Slack builds, you can go to those GNOME, GNOME Slack builds. What was the reasoning behind that? It's been late dependencies. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you ever uh, want to take an exercise for yourself, go from a bare bones system and compile GNOME from source. It'll be good for you. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah it'll I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. no. We we dropped that. So <laughs> no, but, but it is. You know, we do ship XFCE and a few other like super lightweight some stuff like that. But if you want a desktop experience, it is KDE. So. Yes. So speaking from a, a naive end user perspective, mm -hmm. um, I listening to Frank's talk yesterday about Bretson, it, it yeah. seems to me like that is kind of a logical synergy for, for yeah, you, I, and I, I was curious what your that. perspective is on that, and, sure. and how that might transform what you guys are doing in the future. Yeah. Um, my, my curiosity is because there, there are some utilities out there, like uh, Slack Git, which is a, you know, a neat project to get the same like apt powers of the cow for Slackware. But what it has provided for something like Package Kit is binding so that you can, you know, compile and get Package yeah. Kit working in a, in a KDE environment, I mean, a Slackware environment. Um, but as far as any aspects of getting something like Britson, which I would be curious to play with, especially like making sure that if we could, we or I or you know some independent person have a source of having a, a compliant protocol. And then having some end on the other end of it. That's policy kit and console kit and package kit are all very interesting free, des free desktop projects, but stuff like that um, package kit, having native bindings for it would be a requirement. <laughs> and so, since there is not magic here, you, you mean like this is 101 Slackware, it's shell scripts. And uh, having C and C++ bindings for that to make something like Package Kit play nicely would be a, a, a task for, for anybody. Not an insurmountable task, but one of those where it's like you have a working system right now and here do some custom development. So I think it's one of the keep it simple philosophies is not to make ourselves get in the way of ourselves. So something like coding a distribution library, most everything is upstream, so there no, <coughs> hasn't been a need for uh, some kind of distribution library to say, here's how you do stuff on us in a language like C or something. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, it'll, it'll be an interesting evolution. I think it'll be one that we only do when we're forced to. <laughs> Anything else? I, I, actually, I have a question. Um, so you said that you not really related to Slackware. Right. Uh, wh wh one of the reasons why we are doing events like this is now that we want to grow the KDE community. So, mm -hmm. so question to you, are you feeling as part of the KDE community? Um, I, I, I would say as much as <coughs> many users are, uh, as far as developer and everything else, I guess I haven't solved that out. You know, and some of the rest of us haven't solved that out as much. So, so very few patches have come from, not very few, but comparatively few patches have come from the, from the, our core group of folks. That's usually been bugs or something that would completely impair, like adding shadow support instead of PAM to policy kit. 
so that you could actually have K off and change the date time on your desktop without having to have a full PAM implementation. Um, and that might just be the signs of changing times that almost everybody does this, so why not make it standard? So it's been minimal in, in that res regards, but it's been nice because I, I was already doing many things as far as the community otherwise, like helping be a moderator on like, the forums and joining in here and there and doing junior jobs. Um, so and maybe it's not even on my side also that I <laughs> just like just like that quote of it seemed something mystical and then maybe when it happened it was nothing special. So maybe I am part of the community and I don't even know it yet. Because <laughs> um, stuff like that, you know, odds and ends patches or communications with somebody, I've been doing that for years. I was doing that far before I was involved with Slackware and it hasn't changed at all. So um, sure, maybe I, maybe I, I guess I am, but I don't, I don't <laughs> consider myself like that's what I do. It's interesting because I, I, I think for us, we are, we are the core of the community. It's sometimes hard to say, yeah, what does it take to actually make people feel part of the community? And mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, yeah, we, we should include packages and, and mm -hmm. users and uh, people who just love KD for whatever reason. And from sure. my point of view, there shouldn't be a barrier. So I would be really interested in hearing your thoughts. If, if there is a barrier, how we can lower the barrier, how, how we can, can deal with that. But, and another aspect of that is especially how, how we can do that in, in America, the U.S., or <coughs> in the region in particular, um, because I think that, that there must be many KDE users, um, people interested in KDE, people may, maybe even contributing in some way, mm -hmm. which we might not even know, and it would be great to somehow uh, bring these people a bit more together and, and make this a bit more visible, also for, for us, which, which we are the core of the community, but also in general, to whoever is interested in that. Um, and simply put it, uh, I think something that's curious in, in that same giving any kind of a position on it, further than what I do myself, um, it's difficult because the user base of some, you know, from what I've gathered from the user base of like Slackware is such a, a disparate group of people and because of, or whatever you want to say, fact that we keep it so vanilla upstream and we don't meddle in the business, we don't, you know, change and make some background change that says like we're, you know, or, you know, meddling in, in, the, in the in-betweens. When bug reports happen, seldom do they actually come up and through Slackware because the users know that it's as if they got the tarball themselves, compiled it, put it on their system, just like the documentation of getting started. So they can go straight to bugs.kde.org and only without like traversing that and seeing if somebody says, hey, I saw X behavior and I'm using this system, do we have a, a linkage there? Um, and similar to what I was saying to, uh, to Claudia yesterday is I think the only difficulty in what you're describing also is the same difficulty that <laughs> any corporation is seeing also is how how do you how do you ramp into that environment um, whether as a user or as a developer um, having channels of education are you coming in this wanting to be a project manager or you know community manager are you coming in this just wanting to help out with documentation and having like the the documentation you know, education of or channels of edu education match where you feel the community would be coming from. Um, and it, it's a difficult task for anybody, and much less the software collection, you know, the KDE software collection. Uh, and it's been doing a pretty good job of keeping up with that, especially with the task like the Git transition, you know, making sure that, you know, here's here's intro to developing, getting started on compiling KDE, and, you know, mind you, you're going to have to pull stuff from everywhere. It's, that's, a, that's a big task. Um, but just having clear and defined channels of documentation is, is as good as it gets, I think, because everything else is 
build the community, I think that's all. The wheels are pretty well in motion, and there's not a great divide of that. Plenty of good mailing lists, plenty of good like forum support, chat, hiring support, and everything else. So it's there when you need it. Anything else? Well, good. Well, thank y'all for having me.